I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for coming That's to amazing. this for us presentation. Sophia Fowler and I, who she's uh, one of our preschool teachers, um, wanted to have a few workshops set up throughout the year to help parents understand a few things um, about uh, their concerns. One is uh, special ed the process. Some parents aren't really sure um, about the whole process, and so we'd like to inform them. So I talked with Maureen Shields, who um, is from the Parent Information <coughs> Center, and she was willing to do a presentation for us. And we are televising it so that parents that can't come, we can put it on the website and put it on the TV station so they can look at it at leisure. So. Thank you for coming, Great. Maureen. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm so glad everybody had a chance to come in. And it's kind of nice. I like how it's kind of informal. Yeah, so is. feel free to just jump in and ask right. any questions if I'm going too fast or if you're just like, you've lost me, you know? Because it is, um, as you can see from the first handout, I just passed out the steps and, you know, it's a it's a, it's a process. It's, a, it's an in-depth process. So um, I, this presentation really kind of gives you a lot of information. That's why I wanted to give you all a copy. And I'll kind of go through it briefly, um, but if you'd like to talk about it more, just stop me. And um, if not, you have the information to refer back to. So that's what I thought it would be kind of nice. And if you have questions later for Sheila, and after you digest it, you can write it down on your piece of paper and call back. And before we start, I'd like to also thank Katie Gagner, yeah. who's, um, I think, the director of the Parent Support Group, or the... What, what is your type of chip? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. yeah. And Katie um, has worked with us with preschool and now is um, involved with the parent support yeah. group and she's helped to um, set up some workshops and she also has a website. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that because um, and also thank you for all the goodies that you got this morning to yeah. help us out. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so I think you know how to get me. Um, and you're on the Parent Support Group Facebook yes, page now. I just recently found that. <laughs> so, um, well, are you new to that yes. group? Okay, so it was, the Parent Support Group was originally chaired by three amazing veterans. Mm. And then last spring, they started sneakily inviting me to meetings. And mm -hmm. I, uh -huh. they were slowly stepping down and looking for new people to, to come in. So what they used to do was these like monthly meetings and it would get people together and there would be like a topic that was discussed and they had someone from the school and then those folks would leave and then it was just an open forum for parents to really kind of talk. Um, because we are so new and we're rebuilding, um, we've put off some of those more kind of intimate support group meetings and what we are doing is trying to put some great workshops in place and get people out and get parents connected and get people knowing each other and having familiar faces, you know, so when you're in a crowd you see each other. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's where we are, but we are going to, it's on the horizon to start up those support groups again. Um, in the meantime, I'm really using the Facebook page um, as a venue to let people know about things that we're doing and things that are happening just in the area. Um, but you can always reach out to me on there if you have any questions and it's private, it's just between you and I, I'm not gonna blast, hey, got a parent question from, you know, so um, I hope you find it quite helpful. It has been. It's Good. Great, great. Now, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Because I don't know if you all know each other or anybody. Um, who... So I'm Ashley. Okay, I'm Ashley. In, um, fairly new to Merrimack and this process. Um, my son is only two and a half, so he's in early intervention right now. Um, and he, we're hoping to get him an IEP for um, you know the fall. So I'm here learning. Right. Very new to me. And I can say good so. for you because mm -hmm. I just yeah. followed the herd in the beginning. I was like, yeah, I'm yeah. supposed to go here. <laughs> yeah. I'm supposed to do this. Well, that's yeah. kind of how I feel. So. Yeah. Which yeah. I love it. So I'm so glad that you're here. Yeah. You're yeah. going to be way ahead of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Trying. Absolutely. Trying to. I talked to you for starting the process early and being proactive. So mm -hmm. I'm Jill Vanderberg, my husband, John. And our littlest guy is five. He's actually in his third year of MEEP. Um, we held him mm -hmm. back an extra year just to give mm -hmm. him a little more time to develop. He's a summer baby too, so it was pretty reasonable to do that. But he got his diagnosis of being on the spectrum when he was um, just shy of his third birthday. So, you know, we've had a lot of early intervention and MEEP has been phenomenal for him and he's making progress. So we're here to kind of learn what the next step yeah. mm -hmm. involves. So, Great. anything you want to add? That was good. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm Sophia Fowler. I'm one of the preschool special education teachers here um, in the district. 
different kind of going between two schools this year, so between here at Reeds and Master Cola. Great, great. Okay, just a little bit about the Parent Information Center. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of us or know of us, but um, we are a grant program that is funded by the New Hampshire uh, Department of Education Bureau of Special Education. Um, and what the Parent Information kind of has two per has two grants really. One that um, provides uh, phone intake support to parents and provides workshops for parents to build their knowledge about the special education process, how to be um, a good advocate for their child. We have an ad volunteer advocate training program that runs for 11 weeks, one night a week. Terrific program, highly recommended if you can do it. Um, all of these programs and workshops are free um, and we try to hold them all throughout the state. And then I work for New Hampshire Connections, which also falls under the Parent Information Center. And New Hampshire Connections is the part of the Parent Information Center that works with parent engagement. So in New Hampshire, it's completely volunteer whether or not school districts would like to start um, family engagement groups in the special education process or in the special education parents. Um, so that's the nice thing about New Hampshire Connections. We help go out to districts and try to support those um, engage those family groups and get them started because it's as we all know in the special education process the parent is an integral part of the team so it, the more knowledgeable the parents are and the easier they can work together with the school the more, more positive the outcomes for the kids so, so mm -hmm. Maureen joins me um, once a month I meet with John Fabrizio who's the director of special services for the town and Marge Taffrey who's the superintendent and Maureen is at all of our meetings yeah. and helps facilitate those and when yeah, it's great. It's really, it's an interesting job because you get to go throughout the state and see every, nobody does it the same. You know, it's really interesting. And that's kind of the nice thing about in New Hampshire, you know, it's not a law. In Massachusetts, it is a law to have parent advisory committees as part of their special ed programs. In New Hampshire, it's volunteer, and I like that better because I think it, it allows the districts to form their own type of you know, um, group. So it, I, I like it. It gives a little bit more freedom and you share. I, well, I get to see all the different ideas people are doing and it's really neat. So I get to steal everybody's idea and go to other districts and say, try this. And they think, wow, you're good. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. I, usually, I always footnote it. I tell them who's doing what. Okay. So a lit, as you can see, I gave you guys the big handout about the steps in the process. And then I just want to give you a little bit of background and you know feel free to jump in anytime if you feel like I'm off target or anything. But basically um, there's the New Hampshire rules and IDEA. So what, what are the, both of those things? So IDEA is the federal law, the Individuals with Disability Education Act. That is the federal law for special education. Um, in addition to that, every state is allowed to create their own rules that take the federal law and basically kind of make it, you know, to, to your state, you know, to, to customize it to your, your, uh, your type of, um, you know, character of your state or whatever. But the basic rules are every child is, um, with a disability is entitled to a free and appropriate public education. So these are just terms that you'll hear throughout the special education process. And we love acronyms, you know, it, it is Acronym City. Uh, it's unbelievable. And the Parent Information Center, just I'll, I'll provide you our, um, our uh, website at the end, but the, we have actually a definitions and acronym list on our website. And I use that. I used to keep it in my binder and take it to IEP meetings because the teachers were so nice, but I don't blame them for yeah. slipping into. So even tell me if you like, hear me, because I'll throw out acronyms all the time. So the biggies are FAPE, which, you know, free and public, and then um, LRE, least restrictive environment, and then IEP, of course, individualized education program. So that one, those are the, those are the biggies. Least restrictive environment is the environment that every child um, with a disability is uh, entitled to be in, which would be with his non-disabled peers at the most, unless um, the services recommend that, or in need of him or her to be pulled out. Um, let's see. So parent involvement. Parent involvement it is huge in New Hampshire. And this is where our New Hampshire rules are really kind of, um, I don't have the big buzzword right now is exceeds federal, but I would say just clarifies, but it does, you know, we do go above and beyond. Let's put it that way. We really do. We're really lucky to be in a state that does 
um, provide really nice, clear, and specific deadlines um, to support. So school districts, and you're going to see another acronym up there, I'm just noticing, LEAs. And that is another uh, acronym you're going to see a lot. And basically what that means is your local educational agency. That just refers to your person in the meeting that's from the school district that can make decisions about the IEP process. Mm -hmm. That would be a, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you'll always see that on your, when you sign into an IEP meeting, you, you'll always see who's invited to the party, we like to say. You know, somebody will always have L LEA next to their name. Um, and then uh, we provide written notice for an IEP meeting 10 days beforehand, five days for a manifestation meeting, which is a little different than an, uh, an IEP meeting that might be called to discuss kind of an emergency situation. Um, and you, uh, the school has 21 days to respond to the parents' request for the meeting. And um, they also give you many different ways to meet and participate. They, they have to, you have to come to a mutually agreeable time. Um, it, they have to make sure at the meeting that the parents understand everything that's going on in the meeting. So if that means an interpreter needs to be there, and that, that will be provided. Um, and then another right that parents have prior to the meeting is when a child is being evaluated or having some testing done, the materials for that meeting can be requested by the parent five days in advance of the meeting. The parent does have to request it in writing but the school will have those materials um, accessible for the person, uh, for the parent. And the other great area we, we do well in New Hampshire is we, we ask for parental consent throughout the entire process, um, which is, you know, huge because in coming from a parent like me who's now a, a veteran and mine are done, I can tell you I'm so passionate about these New Hampshire pieces of the rules because it engages you as the parent in every part of the process. You know, you sign up for when you're going to initial evaluation to test the child. You have to sign off on that. Uh, determining eligibility is another place, whether or not they're eligible for special ed or not. Um, the annual review, if there's any change in your child's special education program, um, that has to be signed off by the, and get parent consent releasing educational records, um, extension to the evaluation timeline. In New Hampshire, we're fortunate again to be 45 days for an evaluation, as opposed to the federal guideline, which is 60. So we're very lucky that we have a shorter time frame. Sheila's probably like, ugh, we're not, because <laughs> it is. Yeah. it does put our <laughs> schools, yeah. Holidays and vacations and everything. Exactly. It gets yeah. crazy, especially in November, December. I mean, so you are um, allowed to give an, an extension, and the school is allowed to ask for a 15-day extension to the timeline, which I know throughout the process of my kids, like sometimes my kid just would not be behaving for that test, you know, and he was not cooperating. And finally the school psychologist called in the case manager and they said, do you mind if we get a 15 day extension? I said, no, because he's being a pain in the neck. I know he kept making excuses, he's leaving, you know. <laughs> so the extension timeline is terrific and it allows you to collaborate with the team. Um, what else? IEP excusals if a teacher or somebody key to the IEP meeting can't attend. You guys are notified 72 hours in advance if the school knows that. I mean, occasionally you might wake up that morning and a poor um, teacher is ill or can't make it to school, then they, they will give you a heads up. Um, let's see, before inviting representatives for adult services agency, yeah, that's something that, you know, way down the road, but um, when a child is going to be transitioning out of high school, um, a lot of times adult services agencies will be invited to an IEP meeting. Um, or can I just say something sure. about the evaluation? I think what it's referring to for the most part is every three years a child needs to be reevaluated mm -hmm. to see if they still need special education sometimes prior to that. So it's, you know, it sometimes is the initial evaluation, but every three years as they go along and they still need help, yeah. we have yep. to do that exactly. evaluation over again. So that's why yep. it keeps Good coming point. up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And some, you know, and it, it can be requested before earlier than that if you feel like if the child's still struggling and everybody, the team feels like they could use testing. It's usually not within a year, but it could be requested earlier than three years. But, but typically, it's good to know. And then even in three years, sometimes you can waive testing if it's if it's going well and you feel like it's not needed. Um, 
Another, this is a document that we give out, and I was gonna bring one, Sheila, but I'm not sure because they're a little different in every district, the written prior notice. Um, this is a document that gives notification to you as parents um, whenever there's gonna be a change in the, I, in the um, IEP or in your child's special education services. And the reason why we have a big pizza and everything is because it has um, seven different things that the written prior notice addresses. And this is a really important document because if you make a request or the school makes a request and you either proceed to make that change or you don't make that change, this um, form basically tells you uh, reasons listed as to what was the change, um, if it was refused, what documents did they base the rejection on, um, what other options did they consider, what type of evaluations, what observa class observation. So this really is a, a, a great, uh, document very important to the parents because as time goes on and you want to think back to why didn't we do a functional behavior assessment in second grade you know and you can go back and you might have requested it and oh these are the reasons why we didn't do it or this is the reason why we did do it and maybe we need to get another one you know because so it's it's a great document to track history that the IEP team has like gone through and made changes we do use the one from the stand, The standard one, okay, yeah. When we, uh, you know, we'll have people send them to us, you know, for, to look them over. If we have a phone call come in, we'll say, give us your, that's the other reason why you gotta hang on to it and make sure it has a nice spot in a, in a file somewhere. Because usually it tells us exactly, well, you know, they'll say, this, the school said my child, you know, can't have another half hour of speech. So we say, okay, we get me the written prior notice. Then we don't have to listen to just one side of the story. We get both sides from the parent and, and you read through it, and sometimes the parent just doesn't understand, but it makes complete sense in the written prior notice. So we can just explain they might not have understood the way it was written. So it's, it's a great document to have. Um, all major decisions are made by your IEP team. So you are part of that team, so all the decisions have to be made as you, from you guys as a group. Oh, this is neat. I don't know how that happened, but that's yeah. great. <laughs> uh, so all part of the IEP team. Um, these are the people on the IEP team. So parent or legal guardian or surrogate parent. And a surrogate parent is an educational surrogate parent. Who, I'm actually an educational surrogate parent for a child who is in the court system and doesn't have parent representation. So I'm certified to go and be that surrogate parent for that child during the IEP. Um, Student when appropriate. After a certain time, the students can come, or they can come anytime, right, Sheila? I mean, really, if they usually in, yeah. are invited in high school, yeah, and then they can sign once they turn eighteen. They have to sign the IEP. Yeah, that's always. And my kids yeah. started coming when they were about. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My son was in high school. So. <laughs> He had to sign them, like, oh, this is a scary thing, because they have different ideas and parents a lot of times. Yeah, exactly, because I can remember my daughter in, like, ninth grade. I can't wait till I'm 18. I'm signing myself yeah. out of special ed. I'm like, oh, come on. And by the time she got to 18, she was like, no way, I'm staying in, because she knew it was working, and she knew she needed it by then. That maturity had happened. But it was funny, because, yeah, I can remember saying, you going to let me see, you want me to come to the IEP meeting? And yeah. she's like, yeah. But she, she, yeah, she was calling her own IEP meetings by the time she was 18. It was really <laughs> funny. <Yeah. laughs> um, so not less than one regular education teacher, not one less than one special ed teacher. Um, the, again, vocational education program when the child gets older. Um, representative of the local educational agency. Um, and, and a, this is an important one, an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of the evaluation results. So when a student has been <clears throat> referred for evaluation and you go to that meeting, which you'll see is the you know, second one. So say you make a referral, they decide that yes, you need some testing done. The evaluation meeting will have a person there who can interpret exactly what happened through the testing so they can explain it to you nicely school psychologists sometimes, speech 
um, pathologist, yeah. <laughs> so it's nice, that expert that can tell you. And it's not, it may not always necessarily be the person who did the testing. So like if somebody does get sick and they need another speech pathologist to come in and at least give you the results and speak to, you know, the speech results or the OT results or something like that. Sometimes it's not necessarily the person who did the testing, but that's qualified to be able to give you the results. You know, if somebody has that open, open moment to be able to do that rather than reschedule the whole thing. So sometimes there's somebody who's sitting in for that. That's not always the evaluator that did the testing. All right. Okay. And then these are just additional IEP team members. Teacher certified again in the area of suspected disability. A person knowledgeable about the child. Um, for students suspected of having an LD, someone who's qualified to conduct individual diagnostic exams. That's a mouthful, but... Oh, the, learning yes, learning, thank you. <laughs> and for the initial meeting for ch children um, transitioning from early supports and services. Um, part C coordinator or Part C, the, the person who's with your child before they go into the IEP system. So you're... Um, and then when transition from high school is being considered. So again, another nice thing about New Hampshire, when kiddos are, um, a transition plan goes into effect when a child is 14 years old. And you start thinking about what they want to do after high school. So you start planning real early at 14. And it's great. And you, you basically, you know, you ask them what they want to do. And it's kind of funny because they're 14 years old, so they want to be like, you know, an astronaut and all this, and you're like, okay, so we need some science classes, you know, so you, you have to kind of tailor it. But you, that transition plan starts early, and, and it's great, because you do need to start early. And we're lucky here in New Hampshire, because the federal standard is 16. Mm -hmm. you know? and mm -hmm. Some kids might be graduating at 17, so that's, that's really great. Do I have to hit it again for yeah. Oh, look at yeah. that. <laughs> of course. Must have hit some button when I did. Um, so here we are, the steps in the special education process. So <clears throat> starts out with this disability suspected. So um, that could be from anybody, mom and dad, pediatricians, the teacher, um, you know, the preschool teacher, the daycare provider, it could be anybody. Um, if somebody else does refer your child for special education, then you will be notified by the parent, and the parent will be notified. Um, the next step, evaluation. Well, so if they decide that yes, you know, um, it looks like we're going to do some testing for this kiddo, then you go into the evaluation process. And then after the evaluation is done, you go into determination of eligibility. So that's whether or not based on upon those evaluations, observations, and a, a whole load of other, um, you know, evaluations or assessments, um, whether or not that you feel that the IEP feel to, feels that the child is eligible for um, special education. Then after that's done, you go into development of the IEP. And then after the IEP is created, you talk about placement. Where is that child best going to fit their needs? Is it going to be in a regular education classroom? Is it going to be there with some supports? Is it going to be there with a little bit of pull out maybe for speech and and um, OT, so you start talking, the, the IEP drives the placement. Because a lot of times parents will come and say, I want my kid here, and it's like, whoa, they're not even in special ed yet. So I'm like, there is a process. You gotta evaluate their child, you gotta see what their needs are first before we can even talk about where we're gonna teach them and what, and, you know, what placement. Um, and then the last piece of the steps is ongoing monitoring of the IEP. Um, which we'll get into a little bit. But the great thing about the IEP is um, there will be goals that are put into it and there will, the IEP will determine how often those goals will be monitored and um, different aspects of the IEP. So disability suspected referral consideration. Like I said, anybody can be referred. Um, if you folks do do the writing, I mean do do the referral, it's, we always tell you to put it in writing and make sure you keep a copy of your own records because like that timeline showed, once you make a refer referral, the school has 21 days to respond back to you. So you want to make sure it's in writing. And our parents are funny because sometimes we'll say, they'll, everybody's like, can we just email it? You know, because we always say either mail it or hand deliver it. And it, it, email is okay. I don't know if the policies here are email is okay for a referral or do you prefer it to be, hand, you know, dropped off at the office um, and some, one. yeah some emailed some called in some yeah um, letters sent 
Most of them come from early intervention. Okay. So they kind of give us a heads up. We'll have one coming. We'll be sent to you. We have uh, six new referrals coming from early intervention. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Since okay. Christmas. So it's yeah. Like, you know, just yeah. Just trying to get that initial Yeah. Thing yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, things. so you can see, yeah, that's it. It gets the ball moving. So yeah. we always say put it in writing. If it's in writing, it never happened. That's always our thing at, at PEC because it is true. We, I mean, so many phone conversations happen. You know, back and forth, and it's like you got to get some stuff in writing, and this is one of the biggies to get that in writing. And we do get quite a few from um, the program. <coughs> we have typical children in our preschool program, so sometimes yeah. the teachers are concerned with the right. development of children. So yep. a lot of times it's the teacher that's referring. Yeah, to absolutely. Because I know with my own kiddos, it was definitely the teacher, the first. First child was teacher, second child, because I could see it coming. <laughs> I was, but the first one, I was like, you know, oblivious. I thought she was doing terrific. And then, and, uh, and, and you know, it's still even, it was funny because it ended up being my neighbor who was, who referred, was also a teacher. So it was kind of a nice blow for me because she was able to come over and tell me first. I didn't even refer to special, I'm like, what does that mean? And that's when uh, I was lucky because I kind of had her as a tutor at the beginning. Um, Okay, so when we receive the referral, oh, I think I was saying 21, I'm sorry, to the team would be held within 15 calendar days. Sorry about I that. Was maybe it yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm like, whoa! And, uh, <laughs> I know, and I have to tell you, I've been involved in the new New Hampshire rules and, and trying to work out this collaborative agreement, and all we've been doing is talking about calendar days and days and business days and changing the timelines, and I'm like, it's killing me. It's like, it's really, it's interesting. 21, I'd be happy. Yeah, sorry about that. So this is that, that's for an IEP meeting, 21. Um, so this for referral, you can see that it's 15 days because usually if a referral is made, it usually means there's a kiddo that's struggling or, you know, or the parents are like, what's going on? So they want to get things moving. So the 15 calendar days is... And is calendar big. days is the weekends and holidays and everything. Yeah. So there's a lot that's driven by calendar days, so it's worth noting what the what the difference is when you're talking calendar days and business days. Mm -hmm. Business days is your Monday through Friday, but your calendar days includes weekends and holidays and Christmas mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. So it's worth noting so that you know, like, do you want to have a meeting in the middle of Christmas break? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It might not be around. Exactly. <laughs> so those yeah. are worth noting. So this is the first meeting, the deposition of referral, which I always think sounds a little, oh, yikes. I like decision-making meeting. It sounds much nicer. But it's basically, you know, you, you sit there and you talk with the team, and um, it, it, it's 15 days, so it's given the school time to kind of bring to the table what they're seeing. Mom and dad kind of think about what they're seeing. And um, you can discuss, because maybe the child's needs can be met through regular education services. You know, maybe the child is struggling in reading, but we're really not seeing anything too bad, so the school might have some um, other solutions that can meet their, the child's need. Um, or then you could determine if the child should be evaluated for special education. And what that means is that, you know, everybody's probably thinking that there's probably some specialized instruction that might be needed, or there's definitely an area of, of uh, concern. Okay, the next meeting, so the IEP team um, decides additional testing needs to be determined and the evaluations are provided at no cost to the parents. So um, the evaluation must be completed, like I said, in 45 calendar days, but the parent can sign that 15-day extension if needed. Um, if the parent does disagree with the school's evaluations, say you get them and you know the school evaluations say everything looks good, you guys are still concerned, um, you can request an independent evaluation at um, the school's expense, um, or you may pay for your own private independent evaluation. So um, and that and then bring that information back to the table, which a lot of families will do um, their own independent evaluation, and while well, the school is doing the testing and. You can kind of bring them all together. Okay, a little bit about evaluations. Um, they have to assess all areas related to the suspected disability. So um, there's just some areas right there to kind of give you an idea. So why do we say to my, my parents when they're coming to um, an evaluation meeting or they're, you know, list out all your concerns ahead of time. Like what are you seeing? What are your big areas that you're concerned about? List them all down, send them to your IEP team or your, your school folks in, in advance of the meeting so that they can see it. Because a lot of times you're seeing stuff at home that they're not seeing at school. You know, the biggest one is always 
the child's doing terrific in the school setting because they're holding themselves together and they're getting home and exploding and having a huge melt time. And a lot of times the school doesn't know that yet. So, um, so that's why I always ask, you know, let's start that collaboration before you even get to the evaluation because then you can determine, wow, if you guys are seeing those behavior issues at home, let's do some testing in the area of behaviors. Whereas the school might not have thought of that because they weren't seeing it here. So. And then let's see, a little bit more about evaluations. They must be non-discriminatory, so they have to um, be able to assess the child in their own you know, language or level. Um, and they assess the present levels of academic achievement and related development needs. So that one's a mouthful. So that basically, um, basically what they're saying there, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Sheila, is they're looking to, to assess the child where they are right now too mm -hmm. and what they're capable of and then what they're going to have to do later basically. Um, they identify the child's education and RS means related services needs which are um, uh, speech and language, what, uh, some occupational OT, therapy. Yeah, occupational therapy, I keep using OT. So um, They may also include a functional behavior assessment which is um, basically an assessment of behavior. Um, somebody from the school would actually, you know, monitor the child and, and observe the child and they're having some real behavior issues at school, kind of seeing what's triggering those behaviors in the classroom and then um, we'll come up with a positive behavior plan afterwards, so that might be part of it. Uh, functional vocational evaluation is something that would probably be used for an older kiddo later on in the high school years if um, we're talking about that transition plan that's getting them ready for after high school. Um, reflect what the test measures. So if you're getting a math test, it should reflect math results. Um, and use a variety of tools and strategies, so not just a single procedure. So if a child is nonverbal, then the test should obviously be a nonverbal test. So we can, you know, the child has the option of, you know, you don't want to give them a test that they have um, to respond to oral orally to. So um, that gives you a little bit more detail about evaluations. And here's a, a slightly off tangential mm -hmm. question. You're on the on the school provided or district provided evaluation. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, uh, for a child on the spectrum, for example, having a as a parent having an official diagnosis of autism, for mm -hmm. example, obviously opens up a lot of doors. Uh, you know, for other other programs outside the school district, does the school evaluation do official diagnoses, or is it all in the context of what do you need for an, for an education? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question because the IEP is not just about academics, it's about behavior as well. Now, the school can't diagnose autism, but they can do adaptive. They can do different tests yeah. and recommend it, but we always need a doctor's letter yeah. saying that they okay. have a diagnosis yeah. of autism. The same with ADHD. Um, they you know, require <laughs> a medical evaluation as well. Um, but definitely the school can look at different adaptive behavior um, assessments to help the child out and help them succeed in the classroom. Always how, but you know, it, it, it's, it's funny because a lot of times kids um, can be so academically advanced but still struggle in that behavior or even social and emotional piece. So the IEP is all about, you know, having a child be able to, um, and, and, and developing a child so that when they graduate from high school they, they can move into the community and can have a good strong life in the work field and part of that is developing their social and emotional piece too so that's definitely yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah so the IEP is definitely more than just academic so that's why in, in addition to a, a typical evaluation parents will also most likely be bringing information from their pediatricians from their counselors maybe the child is already seeing somebody or working with a behavior specialist all that information can come. The more, the merrier. So along those lines, I could add, is it helpful if you're getting ongoing progress notes from, say, your child's private OT and speech clinic to mm -hmm. send those along in advance? Yeah, like, absolutely. You regularly update mm -hmm. your teachers yeah. and your team with that. So absolutely. So kind of see where they are. It's also yeah. been my experience, um, like if you have someone who's in a social skills group, um, it's really helpful if you send that information along because then the speech pathologist can help mirror that. So it's the uniformity Absolutely. from inside and outside the school. Right. So they're not just learning a, a school skill. It's, right. you know, we're generalizing out. And mm -hmm. so it works in reverse too. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I've now been at two schools, and I find yeah. that um, Merrimack just really nails it in that department. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of times we have parents sign a release so that the therapists can talk mm -hmm. to each mm -hmm. other too, like they get an outside OT, that our OT can talk with them to make sure they're on the same page and figure out who's doing what, you know, and yeah. make sure that it's not contradicting each other too, exactly. because like with speech, mm -hmm. sometimes people can do yeah. things a little bit differently and mm -hmm. it can get a little messy if, yeah. Yeah. if, it's, if it's quite yeah. different. So. Right. And the other thing about the test being administered, um, they have to be valid and reliable, obviously. Every good, I mean, school districts use good testing, and that is reliable. Um, in the language, that is most likely yield um, accurate information. Also by a, a certified or a licensed trained person. And in New Hampshire, the, the other great thing is in our New Hampshire rules, we actually list out the disability category and we tell you who the um, certified or licensed uh, personnel is that would administer that test. So it's kind of neat. You can kind of look that up in advance. Um, and in accordance with test instructions, so the environment has to be appropriate. The kid can't be in a room with you know, four million things going around, unless that's what they're testing, you know. Um, and then the school districts have an option for how they will evaluate children uh, suspected of a learning disability. And basically kind of what that means is um, for a kid who has learning disability, schools are allowed to come up with their own policy on what tests and evaluations they use to come up with a um, diagnosis or, or um, identification of a learning disability. And that is normally posted on their websites. I bet a million bucks it's posted in Merrimack, absolutely, and easy to find. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 learning disabilities in preschool. So. Yeah, that's true. But it's like, yeah, uh, I know it's in uh, <coughs> most, um, mostly like within the, you know, if you go onto the special ed website, but I'm sure you can gain access to that policy. Which Merrimack is redoing their website right now. It's That's right. And fabulous, so yeah, and that you might want to jot that down. That might be a good thing to just put on there, just as a place to access. Um, ooh, what happened here? Loading. Oh, it's a. It's going on on this computer, but not here. So that's good. Um, uh, at least every three years or more frequently, the reevaluation. So that's what Sheila was mentioning just quickly at the beginning. That um, the reevaluation. Every three years is by law that the child should be evaluated. Again, it can happen a little bit earlier if you suspect there's some issues. Um, and let's see, child is eligible to be. Um, oh, and also, yeah, an evaluation or reevaluation if you decide that um, the child is no longer in need of special education. I don't know what that. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, okay, that's what happened. I think I hit it and I must have pushed it back in. That's what happened. <laughs> oh, my son would love that if I could have that after you're done. Yeah. <laughs> He's a big golfer and I know that's one of the, that's one of the biggies. That is so funny. He probably, yeah, exactly. He's supposed to be about one of the best teachers too, you know, that guy. It's so funny because that just came up in a conversation with my son. At, that, about that guy, the golf trainer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so reevaluation. So, like we were saying, yeah, generally not more than once a year, um, but it does happen every three years. Uh, let's see. Then you're at the eligibility stage. So, just to kind of go into our little handout, you're about halfway through. Uh, determination of eligibility. And I think on our page it says, and disability. So, um, the IEP decides the child is eligible for special ed and the disability classification. Um, to be el eligible for special ed, two big things between the ages, or an IEP to be between the ages of 3 and 21, um, and the disability has to negatively impact the child's educational performance. So you could have a kiddo with a disability that doesn't necessarily need an IEP. You know, academically, that disability might not affect them at, at all, you know, or not in a in a area that you would need specialized instruction in an IEP. So um, then the option would be to put that child maybe on a 504 plan, which would allow them under the American Disabilities Act some accommodations. So um, it, like a, a perfect well, a lot of times kids with ADHD um, sometimes you know they're doing fine academically, but they just need that break during class, they need to get up, they need the wiggle room, they need those things. Those accommodations could go into a 504 plan. And um, 
then they might need extended time on a test. All those things can kind of go into a 504 plan. But if the child needed specialized instruction because executive functioning was just off the charts and the kid could not even show up to class with a pencil, then you know they may have put them on an IEP, do some executive functioning goals with them, and some strategies. So that might be the two differences there. A couple of things about your eligibility mm -hmm. meeting. That's usually your evaluation results meetings. Yeah, good Typically point. from early intervention when you've had the, the testing done. So the evaluations is just the process of actually doing the evaluations. The eligibility meeting gives you the results of those evaluations so that then you can discuss eligibility. So you have to, we have to give you the results first and then move into do we think the child is eligible because of the results. So that's all part and parcel of the same meeting. And then another comment about the 504s is sometimes you um, have m other medical reasons why you need a 504. Mm -hmm. So if you have a child with dietary restrictions that doesn't say a whole lot, um, but if something were to happen at the school, you want to have your teacher know, you can always talk about 504s in that sense. Um, a really good um, you know, example of that is a child that has celiac disease mm -hmm. um, and they mm -hmm. have a gluten allergy. It doesn't affect their learning. But you want the teacher to know so that if you're doing counting of M&Ms, they're not bringing in M&Ms that are filled with gluten. Um, right. And now your child can't do the activity. So yeah. there are things like that that you can do with a 504. So just knowing that sometimes it's just a document that you know, goes before your child. Everybody knows we're good to go. And then that's mm -hmm. it. So sometimes yeah. it's not always a, um, doesn't always have to be you know, <coughs> a full grown thing, but that's yeah, no, that's a great point. And especially even like diabetic, you know, children, <laughs> it's all those different. Yeah. So, you know, there's just, it, it's a great plan to make sure that they're accessing everybody. So here, disability categories. So these are just a list of them, you know, briefly, I won't go through all of them, but um, the only ones, I think they're all kind of self-explanatory, but the, uh, uh, Traumatic brain injury and ABI means acquired brain injury, which um, is a, a classification that, a category that New Hampshire added. Um, so a brain injury that had been acquired after birth and not something that was brought on from a genetic um, situation. So um, so yeah, that's that's the listing of them. And you can have Oop. multiple categories. Yeah, absolutely, good IEP. point, thanks. Um, sometimes you have you know, a developmental delay but yeah. your other health impairment is something that may go along um, with that. So sometimes you have a primary and a secondary, which um, you know you can have. I believe it's just two. I don't think three. you can have up to three. Yeah. Okay. Um, tertiary. Tertiary. Yeah. There you go. Uh -huh. um, so sometimes it's you know yes you have other health impairment because but it's worth noting that this child also has blindness or it's worth yeah. oh, the blindness comes first and the other health impairment. Those kinds of things. So yeah, um, yeah. it's just worth noting that there are yeah. you can have multiples. And other health impairments, something like ADHD, would fall under other health impairment. Like it's you know, it's so it's um, like my kids were always two. So there were other health impairment for ADHD, and then they had specific learning disability was their second um, diagnosis. So the most preschoolers are identified as either speech or language or developmental oh, delay. Yeah. Um, but that is only good up until age 10 or yep. 9. Mm -hmm. But it has to be changed to another disability. Mm -hmm. Those don't need it after that point. But that basically means that preschooler has to be at least one Yeah. Okay, then you move into, so say, um, okay, you know, we do decide that this child needs some specialized instruction and um, let's develop an IEP. So um, they have 30 days to develop the IEP once the child is found eligible. And then, um, like we said, it would be reviewed and revised annually. And then with a three-year evaluation, unless one is needed prior to that. Um, also, when you go to this meeting and you first get the IEP, um, you know, you're looking at it. It might not make a lot of sense. It kind of be, it's a very in-depth document. And if it's the first time seeing it, you're kind of like, this mean yeah. exactly yeah. Like, and you want to bring it home and you want to show it to your sister-in-law who's a second grade teacher or you know you want to do something like that or you want to call the parent information center if you have questions or even just take it back and continue to work with your school and say what does this mean what is you know what is I'm not sure um, so you have 14 days to sign the IEP so you can take it home um, 
and then you could have the option to agree with it. If you, um, you could also have the option to agree with conditions or exceptions. So say you agree with most of it, but you really think maybe, I don't know, a functional behavior assessment or there needs to be a behavior goal. Um, you can agree with conditions or exceptions. And sometimes I always encourage my parents before you agree with exceptions or disagree, you know, talk to your case manager first verbally, you know, and talk on the phone and say, hey, should we get together and have another IEP meeting because this is what I'm feeling? Um, and then kind of work together before you have to reject or disagree any IEP. I always feel like try to try to just work with the school first and and um, and uh, see if you and then you can get it signed. And if you do disagree, you absolutely have that option. Absolutely. And I also um, just as a new parent who's coming in, I remember the first time I got my IEP, I just signed it. I was like, okay, this is fine. Yeah. You know, I signed it. I have no idea. Um, I've luckily always had great experiences with my yeah. IEPs and been very happy to sign them. Um, but I always recommend that parents at least give until the night because when you sit at these meetings, sometimes it feels like people are speaking Chinese. And mm -hmm. so it's nice to go home, give yourself a night to sleep, mm -hmm. get up, drink your coffee, and read it again. Yeah. And then you have a little bit more time for it to make sense. And I'm not saying go through with a fine tooth comb and make sure every eye and teeth is just so you have a better grasp of what it is that your kid has signed up for. And maybe there's something you know more about your kid and say, well, I really think they could benefit from more movement rights or whatever it is. And don't be afraid to share your input. But um, even if you think it's perfect, just give yourself a night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. even if you do sign it and then you yeah. see other things that you find that aren't quite right or you want to change, you can always call another meeting or call the coordinator and say, you know, this exactly. is, this, yeah. you know, yeah. I have a problem with this. It doesn't mean that it's set in stone for a yeah. year. We yeah. can always mm -hmm. amend them and change them. Yeah. As it's a know. fluid document. And that's why I always try to tell people because they'll call me and say, I signed the IEP, but there's something missing. You know, and I'm like, it's all right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's just, it's such a formal procedure that I think people get, forget that we're just dealing with other humans. It'll be okay. I've been contacting twice so far this year saying, hey, we're going to make this change because we need to add. Mm -hmm. And that's where we need to add. Mm -hmm. And so just. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so the IEP team must consider when they're developing the IEP, um, child strengths, academic and develop and functional needs. So basically what that means, and it was funny because I thought that's so heavy. Um, it's basically how the disability affects the child involvement in progress in school or in preschool is how they are, uh, uh, you know, can they uh, participate in the appropriate activities and things. So um, it's a little heavy, but. Um, parents' concerns. Also, there's a section in there that is for the parent input, and I always encourage my parents to do their parent input. Um, the IEP team, usually your case manager will send it out ahead of, and it has a bunch of questions. It's usually formatted by district. Um, and just about your concerns, and I always encourage parents, again, because they don't know your concerns, all of them, you know, so it's nice to have them in writing there in the IEP. Um, and then, uh, yeah, go So with those, the child strengths, the academic development, the functional needs, and the parents' concerns. So at the beginning of your IEP, there are built-in redundancies. So a lot of times, your academic development and your functional are restated, like stated the first time, and then we restate it, and then we restate it again. So don't be surprised if in your IEP, it feels like you're, like, you're looking at it going, really need to say this three times? Um, they're built in redundancies for that reason. Yeah. Um, so if it seems like it's redundant, it is. And yeah. <laughs> and oftentimes, yeah. Um, you know, the professionals will say so. Yeah. Um, um, but just be, you know, aware that those, those they're built in for a reason. Yeah. Making sure that there isn't something that's different that needs to be stated. Right. Um, Absolutely. And then the special factors as well in the IEP. So they need to, you know, take into consideration when developing the IEP. Braille instruction for a child who's blind, obviously. Assistive technologies, um, communication needs, if a child needs a communication board, behavior needs. So there are special factors that go into that. And they'll be listed in the IEP as well. Um, components of the IEP. I don't want to get too much in the weeds. Just tell me if, uh, but um, just as you were saying, that, that was perfect. You know, present levels, that's where you are um, academically right now. and where your performance in the general education curriculum is. Uh, annual goals, like I said, if there's certain areas that we need to key on, even social, emotional, um, executive functioning, math goals maybe, reading goals. The other great thing we have in New Hampshire are benchmarks and short-term objectives. 
which are mini goals that go in to measure how well you're going to meet that annual goal. So I love the short-term objectives because if you're doing specialized instruction for say math or reading, you wanna make sure we're doing the right math and reading specialized instruction for that child. So the short-term objectives allow you to see that, wow, yeah, this is working and this is great. If we didn't have them, you'd have an annual goal and by the end of the year, you know, you'd be like, wow, that didn't work. <laughs> and then the whole year goes by. So I think the short-term benchmarks are terrific and those can be reported back to the parent um, in a mutually agreeable time with the parents. Usually they come back with a grading report or monthly, quarterly. quarterly. Yeah, quarterly is always what I... Mm -hmm. One of the things to remember about, about your goals, um, there's a lot of kind of terminology that has to be in there, have to be dates in there, things have to be stated certain ways. So if you're sitting there and you're going, what? Like kind of those math problems that give you a whole bunch of gibberish yeah. and you filter out the math, you're like, oh, you're adding me, asking me to add. That's all yeah, people that yeah. ask me to add. So sometimes it's really looking through those goals and saying, what is it you want my child to do? And when you look at it, you're going, oh, you want them to say two words together. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you ever have a question about that, mm -hmm. sit down and say, can, can you tease out all the extraneous stuff? Like, yeah. what is it you want them to do? And they will tell you right there, this is what we want them to do. Yeah. This, like, this is what this says in mm -hmm. nuts and bolts. When you pull out all the... Know, the articles and you pull out all the gibberish and you pull out all the dates and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. This yeah. is what this goal yeah. means. So don't be afraid to ask specifically what certain goals mean. And then same thing, when you get down to the benchmarks, the benchmarks a lot of times will have all those extraneous dates and things like that in it too. So pull that stuff out and then look, oh, you want them writing their name by the end of the year. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah exactly. These are the steps of how we're going to do that. So don't be afraid to ask those yeah. questions about can, can you tease it out for me? And that's not, great news because yeah. my first IEP had like a million notes down the side because it would say like, by June, so-and-so mm -hmm. will man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but 80% accuracy, I was like, mm -hmm. Yeah, what like, does all that mean? He'll ask for a toy when he wants it. And I was like, yeah. Oh. A bunch of times. <laughs> yeah, a right. lot. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. when you have 20 pages of it, you're like, mm. yeah. I have no yeah. Yeah. yeah, these goals are great. We're going to sign Exactly. Why are we saying this? Yeah. So don't be afraid to ask specifically mm -hmm. what yeah. your goals mean because yeah. they, they are they are written mm -hmm. a certain way for a reason. Yeah. Um, it's a bunch of checks and balances that mm -hmm. is in there yeah. for everybody. Um, it also outlines, you know, for you guys what's going on but if you really need the nuts and bolts of what does this mean yes yeah. yeah absolutely school has nine components it has to be in accordance with the state wow. mandate yeah. so when we had the state come down they had to make sure that we got all those sure. <laughs> wow yeah. right. to make sure that i mean yeah. i've been at meetings where we all agreed and mm -hmm. said we really need him to be able to do x and then we go all right, now how do we write this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've yeah. been in these meetings yeah. together, and it's really funny to see mm -hmm. when you finally have it written, you're like, really? Yeah. It has to be written that way, huh? But yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so they can measure it. It's so they can keep progress yeah. of it. It's so does mm -hmm. he do it four out of five yeah. times so they can check off, you yeah. know, your iPads. And yeah. so. And that's the thing about the IEP when you take it home after that meeting. Digest it. Look yeah. at it. Come up with a list of questions and go right back, because usually it's really good answers. And if you need to ask for that clarification that you're suggesting, which I think is excellent advice, do you ask at the IEP meeting? Yeah. Or would, okay. Yeah. You want to you want to ask. And if you just if you can't ask at the IEP mm -hmm. meeting because sometimes you have time constraints, sure. we all work. Right. So you know, um, if you have to be somewhere else, mm -hmm. um, shoot off an email to the person that wrote the goal. Okay. And a like lot you guys are saying, take it home, digest it, digest it, email. You know, send an email the next okay. day. I have a quick question about this. Right. Can you just run through this with sure. me again? Give me a call, or can you send me back an email and just tell me what the nuts and bolts of this is? And they'll tell you, you know, they'll send something back to you yeah. in some way, shape, or form that says, we want them to do this. The first benchmark says this. The second one says this. The second one says this. Right. It just means I'm going to do it by, you know, fall, winter, and spring. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so definitely ask. But the person who, who wrote the goal is mm -hmm. the person to ask because that's who is going to have it um, the freshest. Really in their head, exactly. Great. The, the other component of the IEP is they're going to also talk about the extent that um, a child will not be participating with non-disabled uh, children in the regular education. So it's nice. It always kind of tells you why. If a, if a child is going to be pulled out and put into a resource room, why is that happening? So the IEP also includes that. 
and more IEP components just to go through them quickly because I just want to be mindful of your time too. What time do we have till Sheila? 10.15. 15? Okay. We want to make sure I at least get through all the steps. <laughs> but the IEP is probably the biggest part. Um, special education and related services and other supports based on peer-reviewed research, the extent practical, to enable the child to advance toward. So again, that sounds like one of the goals, right? You know, I mean, it's a lot of information, but basically what, what um, related services and other supports are is how are we gonna help your child gain access to the general curriculum, participate in extracurricular and non-academic activities as well, and to be educated in, with his peers as much as possible, if not the whole time. Um, and just as we were mentioning, protected dates of service, anticipated frequency and location. This is um, the part of the IEP that always was the busiest to me, the related services. They have to specifically tell you how often, when that child's going to be getting those services, what's the frequency, the location, and the duration of the services. So that's always the area I had my biggest question on because it was like, one week, five times a week. I was I could never read that correctly. It's so more complicated when they transition from preschool into their elementary <laughs> oh, school, and you have yeah. to sometimes list them twice, so it ends up. Looking oh my like gosh! And it's a totally it, different yeah, different it's different a big services. it's a big chart. It's a little overwhelming, yes. but these guys will get you through the weeds of that. Right. You know. Um, keeping in mind, there's a break in the school year too, so summer is a break. So that's what adds in extra lines ah. um, to things. So certain dates. Um, because some of programming is considered separate. Yeah, so, so a lot of times you'll see if you look at your dates, that will tell you. But if you're confused about it, mm -hmm. again, just ask because sometimes 150 minutes is like, what? That's yeah. 150 minutes. Yeah. But when you look at somebody, go two and a half hours, four yeah. days a week. Yeah. Oh, well, say that. Well, yeah, I know. That I know. You have to say it a different way. But <laughs> um, if you're confused about those kinds of things, again, ask. Yeah. Um, or if it looks like something has duplicated dates. Sometimes it's January to yeah. June, right. and then September to December. Yeah. <laughs> so. and Sometimes a service could be offered twice a week in the classroom and twice a week in the therapist's office. So it looks like you know, yeah. it's only yeah. it's like twice, really it different. Yeah. You have to list it out differently yeah. if it's offered uh, at different yeah. I had, a, I had a ton of different highlighters when I'd go through my mm -hmm. IEP just so I could make sure I was like following it. And I'm like, okay, it looks good, you know. Um, so, and that segue is beautiful into the length of school year and school day. Um, it will be necessary to implement the IEP. So um, just as we were speaking about the summer program is different, and they call that extended school year. Um, and it basically, you know, if, if it's deemed necessary for the child to have that during the summer, then um, yeah, you would see that on, on the IEP as well. And what dates those ran from and what services they were receiving. Um, so these are the related services we were just talking about. Just some of the suggestions as to what a related service is. Could be anything um, um, psychological, social work services. Um, you know, uh, the thing I always like is parent training and counseling. I always think that's very cool. That if they're going to implement some sort of a behavior plan, at that you know they could also train the parent in it as well, so everybody's in sync. That's what are some examples of the recreation. Um, recreation and therapeutic. Do you guys have a good, good example, or do you? Um, I can. Um, I don't know about preschool. Um, I know in the older grades, sometimes they might be in a sports um, program outside of school, and they might need an assistant to attend the sport with them, oh, okay. so that they could could ex access that right. okay. sport. That extracurricular so activity, they yeah. Need some extra support. Mm -hmm. so nice. On the soccer team, and the, they don't understand the directions, they might need somebody to be with them. So I know at the high school level, mm -hmm. sometimes they have some additional things outside of school mm -hmm. for students that, so they can participate as well, mm -hmm. or even go to a dance or an after school mm -hmm. after right. school activity mm -hmm. that some of the kids really need. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and you'll notice trans. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kate. No, no. Oh, I was just going to mention transportation's in there too. If you needed to take a alternative bus, you know, um, that would be listed under related services as well. Yeah. Did you have one? No, I'm too. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, like they have uh, at Master Cola, they have like before school. There's a running club, so our little guy wouldn't sign up for it. But if he had wanted to they would have been able to have somebody who could help him be there so he could follow the rules. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, right. Even yeah. though it's like outside the normal hours mm -hmm. of school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. before, that's yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, more IEP components. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Statewide assessments. If the child is going to need some accommodations for those, they'll be listed there. Um, it, services provided. Who will implement the IEP? Um, be the IEP team, the folks, your case manager. Uh, financial responsibility for the IEP is usually goes back to that person who's the LEA, the local educational uh, agency representative. That's usually the person that you'll see their name there. Um, and then the signatures of the parents and that LEA again. Um, oh, this is for older students. I'll just brush through this because we're dealing with such little guys. Um, but basically, like I was mentioning, the transition services um, that go into Effective 14 and a, and a whole new set of goals for what a kid might want to do after. And we briefly mentioned the rights that will transfer at the age of 18, which is a little scary, but yeah. <laughs> um, and then we move on to placement. So we're getting there. So determination of placement, like I said at the beginning, um, it's the IEP that actually uh, drives the placement. So you have to develop that IEP first and see what type of services the child needs, what type of specialized instruction, before you then can you know, determine where the education should happen. Um, then usually placement options, there are a variety of different um, options for placement. So, uh, and preschool even has like uh, their own specific ones, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, um, you know, the child can be in the regular ed classroom in a resource room for, a, you know, certain time. Um, what are some of the other ones I'm drawing a blank? Preschool, um, we even have the child can come in just for speech therapy. Right, it's right. Speech program. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. come in just once a week for speech. Yeah. We do have the um, um, in inclusionary preschool programs mm -hmm. that some mm -hmm. students come to. We have yeah. one self-contained specialized program mm -hmm. and they might start on that for some ABA services but then as they're able to handle more they go into the inclusionary and then we add more days and more time so it can change two or three times like I said within a year depending on where the child's at. Mm -hmm. Our goal is always to get them into that inclusionary yeah. program as much as possible. So possible. that's so you would that that would be the first placement then if that placement were to change you guys would be brought in and a signature would be required in a discussion that now we're going to move more to the inclusionary program. So that's the nice part again, the parents are involved in every part of the process. So it's nice that, you know, they won't just go moving the child without first talking to mom and dad. So, okay. And then monitoring. So the IEP um, includes a statement of how the child's progressing towards the annual goals and will be measured and will be reported to the parent and it's called the sufficiency statement. So in addition to monitoring those goals and monitoring those short-term objectives, um, the school also will give you whether or not we think we're on target to meet that annual goal. So, and an annual goal by the end of the school year too. So it's really, um, the monitoring is, is really helpful. You definitely, if you're paying attention, you're really, <laughs> you're staying on it, the progress. Everybody should be on the same page, so it's, it's great. Um, so basically, that takes us through each and every step. Um, just a little reminder here, um, you know, if there are dispute problems with the IEP team, there are informal and formal options. Um, informal, always the best way to go. Always, you know, I went through special ed from first grade to 12th grade with two kids. And thank goodness, never had to do any formal dispute resolution. And we didn't always agree. You know, we, we didn't always agree. Um, and especially when we got a little older, you know, um, it, but we just worked it out, you know, and we'd, we'd get back around the table and we'd, we'd work things through. So um, at, at PIC, we always, you know, a lot of times when parents call us, they'll be usually angry <laughs> if they call something has happened. And they'll call and, we'll, and they'll say, I want to get a lawyer, I want to do something. Oh, hey, let's, when was the last time we had an IEP meeting? You know, eight months ago. It's like, okay, let's all get back to the table and here's what you want to bring to the table, you know, your concerns. So, we always yeah. call the coordinator um, to set up a meeting. Or exactly. To discuss things with them about your concerns because it could be something that could be fixed by yeah. just talking to the therapist or whatever. You yeah. Know, so yeah, exactly. Exactly, and, and at the Parent Information Center, like I said, we offer free workshops. We try to make them spread out throughout the state, um, and we do have workshops on our P 
pick website to go in and you can see where they are and, and pop in, they are free. And we do effective communication. And, and we also just try to educate parents as much as possible so that you can be a really productive member of the IEP team and be able to give your input. Fabulous one coming up on February 6th. Nice. The difference of IEPs mm -hmm. versus 504. There's a good segue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's on the um, Facebook page, but I'll be bringing it back up to the surface again. Um, another thing that I love to share with parents, and I didn't catch on to this until I was like three years into it, I used to have this great like um, file folder, right? And I'd keep all my things, which you couldn't really see unless you started doing this through all of them. Now I have a library. So I work, my son's in his fifth year of school. And we have um, binders, three ring binders. And if I had started this in the beginning, it would have made my life so much easier. But if you leave here and go yes. to the dollar store, get a three ring binder, buy their little separator tabs, whatever, and just put in, even if you have no idea what those papers are right now, but be like communications from the school, stick it in, you know, one tab, whatever, it becomes so much easier. If you correspond with the school and email anything, that's all part of your kids' story. And what's really helpful is we happen to be in a situation with my little fellow right now. We had something very similar to this happen. I pulled out last year's binder and I'm going through and you find that same behavior, photocopied that, was able to bring it to the school and said, oh yeah, last year we did this exact thing. This is what we did to help. And well, it was great, you know? And then you can see kind of a history yeah. of things. But it makes life so much easier. Yeah, and I think your team appreciates that too, mm -hmm. when, especially when you transition from school yeah. to school. Because, you know, it's nice that they didn't know what happened back in the, you know, lower primary school or whatever, right. you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's terrific. And we actually offer an IEP organizer workshop. So keep your eye out for that one, too. Yep. And you're, you're good about updating. Like, I want to say in the fall. I think so, yeah. One. Yeah. It's a, but I think there's a note <clears throat> that's recommended when you graduate from EI. Close that binder and start a new one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't you actually? Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Start the binder. Yeah. Listen, I did start the binder. Don't. Yeah. Cool. So I did. And I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I always use ourselves as an example. Like, don't just copy. Just start now. Yeah. So don't copy. Backtrack. Yeah. Organize everything. Yeah. Just start now and say, okay, from here forward, yeah. this is what And I'm then just take that binder and put it away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I you should see my house with two kids that went through all school. So I have tons of binders. My husband said to me the other day, now they're both in college, he said, can we get rid of those binders now? I'm like, not yet. And the funny thing is we're having a discussion with the state, with the state rules when to give the okay for schools to get rid of the records. And here's just a funny story. My nephew was on an IEP. He's 25 years old now. He's working, graduated from college, and he's looking to get certified. He's a IT guy. And he was kept flunking the certification at work. And he was just bombing it. He needed extended time. So he said to the person in HR, you know, I used to, I need always had extended time in school. She goes, you can still get extended time as an adult because I, the American Disabilities Act still considers him a child, a person with a disability. So he had to go back to the high school and get his last testing. And I said, you're so lucky they didn't destroy those records because, yeah. you know, they don't have to hang on to them too long. But yeah, not, but they, uh, so it's so that just to give you an idea of how because my sister wasn't very well organized and didn't have the records. So <laughs> yeah, college, yeah, 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 very very helpful. Yeah, so it is. It's it's a lot of information. I hope I didn't overload you. I'm glad you have the um, presentation and you can feel free to, you know, call us at PIC with any questions and. Um, use our workshops, but I would have, if you guys would